Good morning again. Hope you have your Bibles. We're going to start in the beginning. Turn to Genesis, Genesis 3. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for being in our midst this morning. and Thank you for your word that you've given us, Lord, to lead and to guide us and to illumine our pathways. Thank you, Father, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. We ask you to take your word this morning to instruct us, to lead us and guide us throughout this life, that we can be your children, Lord, bringing glory to you upon this earth. Words that I speak, Father, I ask you, Lord, to speak them through me. I yield to you, Lord, as an empty vessel. Believing that, Father, as your word is spoken, that it would be carved upon our hearts. That we would not just be hearers of your word, Father, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning... Genesis 3, beginning in verse 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together. And made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife. Hid themselves. From the presence of the Lord God. Amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam. Adam. And said unto him, Where art thou? The title of today's message is, Where are you? I want to make some observations here. In verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I think probably that Adam and God had an appointment, a set appointment that every day at this time they got together and enjoyed the fellowship of one another in the garden, in the cool of the day. And so I think, I mean, God's all-knowing, right? Okay, so give me some license here. But when Adam didn't show up, God knew something was up. He already knew something was up anyhow. But when, when he wasn't there, God sought him out. God took the initiative to seek out Adam. Look in verse 10. And it says, this is Adam talking, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He had a knowledge of sin. God had given but one commandment. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only law that Adam had that he had to obey. One little thing. One thing to do. Don't eat. And so Adam knew when he had broken that covenant between he and God and he had eaten that he was wrong. There wasn't any question in Adam's mind that he had sinned. And so the first thing that he thought to do was to hide himself from God. 
We do that as well. Let's look at Romans 4. Where are you? Should be in Romans 4. Chapter 15. Or chapter 4 verse 15. Because the law works wrath. For where no law is. There is no transgression. Well. Well. There was a law. Don't eat. And when he broke that. He knew that he had transgressed that law. While we're there in Romans. Let's flip over a page. Look at Romans 5. And verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience. Many were made sinners. So also. By the obedience of one. Shall many be made righteous. That's our hope. Jesus Christ the righteous died for you. He shed his blood. So that you might have eternal life. And he's seeking you out this morning. If you're not saved. If you don't know Jesus Christ. Your personal Lord and Savior. He's knocking on the door of your heart. Let's look in Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He sang that this morning. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So where are you this morning? Where are you in your walk with God? Where are you in your faith? Where are you in your attendance? Hebrews 10.25 Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger. If it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply. And I get it. People take vacations. That's all good. But there in Hebrews in verse 3. Are you growing faint and wearied in your mind? Let's look in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Beginning in verse 19. Who being past feeling. Have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. To walk up. To work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him. And have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Past feeling. That's really what we're going to be talking about this morning. The title is where are you? The question is. Are you past feeling? Past feeling, beyond feeling, not able to feel anymore. So what does the word feel mean? It means apathy, to be apathetic. Webster defines a lack of feeling or emotion. This is apathy, is a lack of feeling or emotion. A lack of interest. Indifference. Are you indifference to attendance? Indifferent to the word? Indifferent to the praise? Indifferent to one another? If 
if you read Ephesians 4.19 in the New American Standard Version, it says callous, to be callous. The word in Greek is apatheus. Pathos means to invoke sympathy or compassion. And we know that if you put the A in front of it, it negates that. So it's to not have sympathy or compassion. To not have feeling towards sin. The world has lost its sense of shame. Isn't there no shame in Sodom? Let's look at Psalm 53. Psalms chapter 53 and verse 1. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 3, and verse 7. In that day shall we swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance does witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say to the righteous that it shall be well with him. For they shall eat the fruit of their doings. But woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. They don't hide their sin anymore. It's not in the closet anymore. Homosexuality is on display before the world. Transvestites are on display before the world. They bring them into the schools to read to their children. Second graders. Kindergartners. There is no shame in Sodom. Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6. Verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. That time is coming soon. We have a message for the world. Have we failed in our compassion? Are we past feeling because of the evil around us? Are we being lured into apathy because of the sin about us? Is our soul being vexed 
as was Lot's. Right there in Jeremiah, let's turn to chapter 8. And verse 12 basically repeats that same thing. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Look at, back at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Let's look at 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three and verse thirteen talking about the end times. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that in the end times it shall be as in the days of Noah. The days of Noah was wicked times. Sin was on display everywhere, as was it in Nineveh. As was it in Sodom. God's attitude towards the sin of the world. The sins that are out in the open. And unashamedly practiced on a regular basis. God's attitude is destruction. When he looked down in the day of Noah. He said. It repenteth me that I have created man. I will destroy man and all of my creation. Every living thing that creepeth upon the earth will I destroy because of the wickedness of mankind. But Noah found grace in his sight. Noah found grace in God's eyes that he and his family would be spared. And I believe this morning that you have found grace in God's eyes. And that you and your family will be spared as well. Let's look, look at the story of Noah a little bit here. In Genesis 6. Sixth chapter of Genesis, beginning in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's look at Proverbs 15. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are every, in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You can be sure your sins will find you out. You might hide it from your boss. You might hide it from your parents. You might hide it from your neighbor. 
But God is everywhere. God is in the darkness. And he will bring you into the light. Is there no shame in Sodom? Let's look at Isaiah 3. Actually, I think we already read that. Yeah, we don't need to read that again. Lawlessness, that's the day that we live in. We live in an age of lawlessness. It's all around us. Our cities are being burned to the ground. Automobile dealerships destroyed. People's lives wasted. There's destruction all about us because of lawlessness. It says in Judges 21, 25, and in that day there was no judge, but every man was a law unto himself, doing that which was right in his own eyes. That's what we have today. There is no shame in Sodom. Abortion on demand. Over 60 million children murdered since 1973. Virginia's own governor can go in public and say that he has no problem performing an abortion. And if the child survives, to take him and gently lay him aside and make sure that he's comfortable until the doctor and the mother can decide whether the child should live or should die. That is evil. That is wickedness. Why cannot every Virginian cry out against that? Elections have consequences. Transgenderism. What are they teaching in school now for proper pronouns? It used to be he, she, and it. Now who knows? It's no longer he, she, and it. It's a list of 237 or something like that. Genders. Brothers and sisters, all you out there in streaming land, let me assure you, there are only two genders. The Bible says that God created man and woman, period. And if you have any questions, check your drawers. Homosexuality. Call it what you will. We don't hate you. But you have turned yourself over because you denied the truth. You've turned yourself over to all sensualism. To deny God's very creation. And there are all manner of sexual perversions. Bestiality. And many things I could name that I'm not going to. The school system is trying to rob our children of their innocency. I mentioned before that transies the queens going into the schools and reading to the kindergartners. Being accepted as normal. When the abnormal is accepted as normal, there's no more blush. There's no more shame. There is no shame in Sodom. Something in the schools being introduced. I don't know enough about it really to expound on it, but there's something called Project 1619. It's out in the open. They're no longer going to teach American history as we were taught in school. 
And it goes way beyond that. I call it the BLY indoctrination. And now I don't remember what I wrote that. Uh, what it stood for, but it was. <laughs> anyway, I'll come up with that, okay? But sin is openly exposed, and they don't care. They just don't care. There is no shame in Sodom. So one of the things we've lost, being past feeling, is shame. What are some of the other things that we've lost being past feeling? A loss of love. That's the sign of the end times. Let's look at Matthew 24. Yeah, I don't mind being embarrassed. My God's still on his throne. Matthew 24, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Is your love waxing cold because of the evil about you? We're exhorted not to become weary in well-doing. Let's look at Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 3.13. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. 1 Thessalonians 4. God is so good. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 8. He therefore that despises, despises not man but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, you do it towards all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But, you beseech, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. It's the Buzz Lightyear doctrine. B-L-Y indoctrination. The Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. Okay? So, I told you to come back. So how deep of a love does God expect of us? Let's look at Romans 5. Where are you? Are you past feeling? I hope not. For when you were yet without strength, beginning in verse 6, chapter 5 of Romans. For when you were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commends his love towards us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't look in that garden when he was on his knees sweating great drops of blood down through the ages and see what a perfect, beautiful individual you were. He saw that you were lost without a Savior, without hope, destitute, dead, forsaken, Use any adjective you want. But he saw you as God's creation. 
He saw you as God's child. And he had compassion. He had compassion. He despised the shame of the cross. Got up and gave his life for you and I. So that we might live. Let's look at Matthew 5. Verse 46. For if you love them which love you, what reward of you? Doesn't the world do that? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Don't the unsaved do that as well? Be therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. How is he perfect? Jesus gave himself for you while you were yet sinners. Let's look at Luke 6 verse 32. Sixth chapter of Luke, verse 32. For if you love those which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to those which are good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do the same. And if you lend to those who you hope to receive again, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But I say to you, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Let's look at First John. Chapter 3, verse 15. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We should also, we ought, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. How deep of a love does God expect of us? Look over a page, 1 John 4 and verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also. It's a command. That's how deep of a love God expects of us. He expects us to love the unlovely. So we see then that we love God only as much as we love the person we hate the most. Look back in verse 8 in the same chapter 4 of 1 John. He that loves not knows not God for God is love. That's how deep a love God expects of us. So where are you? Are you past feeling? 
Are you past shame? And no longer ashamed of the sins of the world, the sins of friends, your own sins? Are you past love? Have you forsaken compassion? Let's look back at Big John, chapter 13. John 13, verse 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. It's a sign of our discipleship when we can love the brother. I mentioned before it is a commandment. In John 15, 12, right there in John, John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. You want to be a friend of God? Keep his commandments. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends. For all things have I, that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Galatians 5.22, it's the first fruit that's mentioned is love. And we see in Galatians 5.14, that it's the fulfillment of all the commandments. As it said in this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your might and to love your neighbor as yourself. For in this are the law and the prophets. It's pretty simple. When you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't steal from him. You won't kill him. You won't, won't besmirch him. etc etc but note that it says more than yourself or as yourself it says love your neighbor as yourself not more than yourself some of you have a problem loving yourself just the way you are if you're saved that should not be a problem because Jesus loved you just the way you are. And he still loves you just the way you are. He's not finished with me. He loves me just the way I am. I know that I can walk with him daily and talk with him right where I am. Because Jesus Christ said, it is finished. I have to see that finished work. I have to look into God's word and let it reflect back at me what he's doing in my life. I don't see the end of it because if I did, I'd be able to walk through these walls and have a glorified body. I would not have pain. I would not have a limp. I don't see that right now. But I know Jesus said, it is finished. I know that the end of all time, I know where I'll be. And I hope you do. Let's look at Acts 24. Yeah. 
help if I went the right direction. 24th chapter of Acts. Verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. That's a pretty high order. But it's an important order. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. All you Bible scholars will know where I'm going with that. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. You can go off to West Africa and be a mighty evangelist. But if you don't have love, if your motive is not the motivation of love and compassion for those people, it is worthless. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love is vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. It seeks not its own. It is not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. It doesn't sit around trying to figure out how to entrap somebody. Love rejoices not in iniquity, does not rejoice, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. And now by his faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. How deep is your love? So where are you? Are you past feeling? Have you lost compassion? Second Timothy 2, 3. Let's turn there. It says to endure hardness as a good soldier. I'm sure you've heard it said. Because it is true. That war will change you. We're all in warfare. We're all in a battle. Daily. As we go out into this world. We're battling. Against sin. We're battling against a world. That has no shame. That flaunts its sin before you. Now, oft times, a soldier who's been in battle, but he becomes weary in the battle, weary in the fight. There's some called PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome, that can affect a man. It doesn't make him any less of a soldier. Christians, I think, sometimes have PTSD. 
when they've gone through struggles. They feel like they've lost in the battle. They can't see the work of God of Romans 8.28 that all things are even working for your good in the darkest hour. They're working for your good. We can't always see it at the time. Sometimes it's years down the road before we'll ever see it. Sometimes we may never see it until we get on the other side. And see the people that are there. With a testimony. That it was how you handled your struggle. Your trial. That I am here. You may never see that in this life. But if you truly believe Romans 8.28. That all things are working together for good. Do not allow the devil to drag you down with that. You've got to rise above it. And then it's your choice. I know that's easy for me to say. Because when it's your struggle. You've got to overcome it. I can't overcome it for you. But don't get the survivor syndrome either when you're in the fight. You know, you go off to battle and all your buddies were killed. But you made it back. Don't get to the point where you beat yourself down. Why did I live? Why didn't I die too? I should have died back there with them. No, God had a plan. You've got to accept that God had a plan. God had a plan for your life. You may not see it yet. My feeling about a soldier is that, and this, like I said, this does not make one that struggles any less of a good soldier than this soldier, but a soldier who can go to war and fight his heart out and do what he's got to do to win the victory and to come home safe. And then he can come home and still have compassion and love to his family. That he wasn't hardened by what he saw. And he hasn't forgotten who he is. Especially a Christian soldier. Don't ever forget who you are in Jesus Christ. Don't ever allow yourself to be hardened, to be past feeling because of the struggles. Compassion and love. Never let them die. Look at Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We see instances in Matthew 14, 14, where it says Jesus was moved with compassion. Mark 1, 40 through 42. Jesus was moved with compassion and the leper got healed. Mark 6, 34. It's a parallel incident to this one in Matthew where he preached to the people because he had compassion 
And then he had so much compassion for him. You see, following that, the miracle of the loaves and bread, of the loaves and fishes. Jesus had compassion. A quote from an unknown source says, never allow yourself to stop caring. Feeling too much is better than not feeling enough or not feeling at all. Never allow your compassion to become apathetic. Asympathetic. Apathetic. So where are you? Are you beyond feeling? The fourth topic is the loss of mercy. Matthew 5, 7 said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let's look at Luke 12. Twelfth chapter Luke, verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom when his Lord makes ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But, and if, that servant say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him. And at an hour when he is not aware. And will cut him in sunder. And will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will. And prepared not himself. Neither did according to his will. Shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For, whoso for whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. You know, we call ourselves deeper life. We look in verse 49. I'm come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? If we have grown past feeling. And we are no longer able to be merciful in our deeper life walk. We will find our place with that wicked servant. The more that is expected of you, the more knowledge. The more you've been shown, the more mercy you've been shown, the more patience, the more understanding, the more mercy, and the more grace should you be able to show to others. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore let him think he stands, take heed lest he fall. Romans twelve three says, Think not yourself more highly than you ought. Deeper life Christians, don't think yourself more highly than you ought. You weren't where you are at one time. Don't forget where you came from. It's good to know where you're going. But it's also good to know your roots. Romans 
Romans 14. This is what you don't want. Romans 14, verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if your brother is grieved with your meat, now walkest thou not in love. Don't destroy him with your meat for whom Christ died. Don't destroy him with your deeper life. Christ died for him too. Let not your good be evil spoken of. You can be walking perfect in your eyes before the Lord. But you can cause somebody to stumble because of your brackishness. Just stale water. You know it here, but it's never fallen to here. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Let's look at Matthew 8. I'm sorry, Matthew 18. 18th chapter of Matthew. Somebody texting me? Oops. And when he had begun to reckon, well, when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. And he loosed him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou, hast, that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. When you have been shown so much love, so much compassion. So much forgiveness. That Jesus Christ would shed his blood for you. Can you not do the same for your fellow servant? Psalms 106. Psalm chapter 106, verse 7. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked God by the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. Don't forget the mercy God has shown you. Another quote from an unknown source. Being mature is being able to have your opinions and beliefs challenged without feeling personally challenged or attacked. So where are you? Are you past feeling? Let's look at Jude. The conclusion of the matter. But beloved, 
Remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. And should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. <coughs> and others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior. Be glory. Majesty. Dominion and power. Both now and forevermore. Let him that has ears hear what the Spirit says unto the church. Father, I thank you for your word. Let us take to heart. Let us never grow weary of hearing of your word. Plant your words upon our heart. Impress them into our hearts and our minds. That we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers. That we would not be deceived in this last hour. In Jesus' name. Amen.